Olá a todos. Deixa eu ajeitar meu cabelo aqui, que está desarrumado. Ah, boa tarde a todo mundo. Opa, deixa eu tirar o áudio aqui de novo. Então, eu quero dar boa tarde a todos do Programa de Pós-Graduação em Neurociências e Biologia Celular. Eu sou o professor Vago Souza e hoje a gente está dando mais uma atividade de webinar, professor Luiz Carlos de Lima Silveira, edição de novembro de 2023. Nessa, nessa aula de hoje, pessoal, eu vou trazer como convidado o professor Bruno Duarte Gomes, que também é professor aqui do programa de pós-graduação, e o Bruno vai assumir aqui a a, a, a sessão, porque o convidado aqui ele está trazendo, é um colega dele das épocas de pós-doc. Então, Bruno, obrigado por você ter aqui participado junto com a gente e fique à vontade, agora é com você aí, viu? Muito obrigado, Jivago. Boa tarde a todos. É muito bom estar aqui com vocês. A gente vai ter uma conversa muito legal com o Kartek Srinivasa. Kartek é um amigo de longa data, fez parte da... da do projeto de pós-doc, né, com o qual eu trabalhei de 2014 até até 2016. É um, um neurocientista muito uh, versado e culto no que ele faz. É é uma das poucas pessoas em neurociência, inclusive, que eu tive o prazer de conversar e que entende uma uma amplitude imensa de coisas em neurociência, não só o que ele vai falar com vocês hoje, mas também entende muito neurociência sensorial, neurociência sensor, é, é, celular, a parte de modelagem biofísica de, de sistemas neurais, tanto artificiais quanto naturais. Então, uh, o Kartek já está no MIT faz alguns anos, acho que um pouco, cerca de seis anos. Eu espero que vocês gostem do que ele vai falar. Eu conversei com ele sobre ministrar, falar com vocês sobre um assunto uh, de modo leve. Então, ele vai, ele captou a mensagem. Uh, por favor, façam perguntas, não se sintam intimidados a fazer perguntas nós vamos ajudar no que for preciso, eu e Vago, inclusive passando as perguntas de vocês para o inglês. Tá bom? Vamos lá. Então, eu vou convidar aqui o nosso convidado, Kartek. Então, Bruno, fique à vontade para falar com ele já em inglês e deixo tá, com obrigado. vocês aí. Ok. So, Kartek, I just introduced you to everybody. Um, I said that you are... You are a great friend of mine, and you are a, uh, a scientist, a neuroscientist that I admire. You understand a great amplitude of subjects in neuroscience, from uh, neurophysiology itself to um, uh, modeling, um, uh, biophysical modeling. So it's with you now, Karthek. Welcome. All right. Thank you so much, Bruno. Uh, thank you, Jivago, too. Uh, I am very glad uh, to have been invited to give you all this lecture. I hope students are seeing this in the YouTube uh, stream that you mentioned. Uh, my topic of lecture today is going to be a very broad overview of what I've called as the cognitive neuroscience of selective visual attention. Uh, by the end of the talk, I hope I would have convinced you how important visual attention is to humans and animals and biological organisms. That's my hope. And if people have any questions, I've actually asked Bruno to intervene in the middle and ask me questions. So please keep it very informal. Uh, and I'm very, again, as I said, I'm very, very glad to be giving this lecture to all of you. This is my office here at MIT uh, in Cambridge. And uh, my friend Bruno used to be sitting behind me for a couple of years. Uh, and we used to share this office. And if people can see, this board is where we used to write all our ideas and sit and discuss. And uh, he has been a great friend of, of mine since 2014, and we are still collaborators. Uh, I won't be discussing anything about our collaboration today because it's a little too high end. And I've decided to make it a little more uh, 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 cogent for students because it is a class at the end of the day and I wish to teach you something. Uh, so with that, I'll start. Uh, but before I start anything, uh, let me do one, one thing. First, I'll acknowledge the people. Uh, most importantly, 
the boss. <laughs> That's what all both of us call him. Uh, all of us call him the boss, Bob Desimone. He's, it's, I work in his lab, and he's one of the greatest uh, neurophysiologists, and he still continues to inspire all of us. And uh, my team is on this side, Eric Lovett, who's now in Netherlands. And of course, this is your boss, Bruno, and this is me. This was a picture taken in 2019 when Bruno visited us for about three weeks and we were discussing our work. And I'm very glad that we took this picture in this office. So I want to acknowledge my team, uh, Bob, Eric, and Bruno. With that, I will start this lecture. Um, first, uh, let's start off with something very, very simple. OK, uh, what are we talking about? Humans or most organisms are relying on certain global states and operate on certain global states. The global states are the ways in which we function in the world. Our brain allows us to function in the world and it controls our actions and so on. There are two broad global states one can think of. One is wakefulness, the other is sleep. This is again a very coarse, uh, how do you say it? A very, very coarse classification. We can go further. In the wakefulness state, you can see that there is inattentiveness, drowsiness, relaxed states when you're not paying real attention. And then there is the attentive, very alert states, which is what most of us have to be in whatever actions we do, whether it is, you know, riding your bike or driving your car or walking on the street and navigating so that you don't hit on other people. You're always paying attention and attentive state involves two categories. You have to make a decision, either contingent upon the environment or based on certain goals that you have. You can't be attending to the entire world. You can't be paying attention to everything in the world. And you have to ignore certain things. So that's why attention is a very, very selective process. We pay attention to certain parts of the world and we ignore certain parts that we think are irrelevant. For example, when you're driving or riding a bike, you're more attentive to what's happening in front of you and on the sides. You might pay much less attention to what's happening on the pavement and so on. So this is a very, very important process by which humans and most organisms are able to navigate the world and do very many things. Attention is at the very foundation of how humans operate, not just humans, most biological organisms with a brain. OK, so my topic today is going to be talking about what people have so far thought about in the history of cognitive neuroscience with respect to uh, selective attention. So it's both a history of the field and a very, very broad history of the field. So just take a look at this figure. And I'm going back. I'm going to ask you if I don't know whether people can reply here. Uh, how many of you were able to read in that very short presentation what was written about the door? My bet is a large number of you will not have even read what was written on the top of the door. In fact, most of you might not have even recognized that there were words on top of that uh, door. That's because you have been paying attention to something else. For example, this is what was written on top of the door. For success, attitude is as important as ability. But then I briefly presented something, and I asked you to I asked you to tell me what was there on the on the top of the door, and most people usually can't. That's because our attention is always focused on certain things. Okay. For example, it could be just the the girl looking at that book and our attention is only directed at that book and we just we ignore everything else those are distractors as far as our goal is concerned in this case this is just one example you might have actually looked at the flag over here and discounted everything else others will be considered as distractors and only the flag will be considered as something that your attention was directed at this is the phenomenon that we are trying to understand both psychologically as well as in terms of what are the brain areas that are involved and this is a very very profound topic i'll tell you why i'm going to show you another demo 
if people can find out what is happening, I'll be interested to know. Okay, here is a picture. It'll be flashing on and off. How long does it take for people to find out that there is something changing? Okay, I'll stop here. Uh, if anyone had guessed anything correct, I would be very happy. The answer is this entire turbo engine here goes missing in the flash. Such a big object, and it can easily be taken out of your attention, and you won't even know it's missing. That's how profoundly our attention works. If you don't pay attention to this area, you will not even know that there was a change made. OK? This is how we operate in the world, with very, very finite and limited capacity. And somehow, even with that limited capacity, we are able to navigate and actually survive in this environment. Here is another example. Let's see if I can play the movie. Uh, just give me a second. Maybe I should uh, remove this stuff. There's a pointer. Here, I'll show you a, a video. Things will change in the video. Pay attention to the whole video and see how many changes you can notice. If people have noticed changes, uh, I would like to know how many you could count. If you had counted about seven, you are a super attentive person in this world because these are all the changes that happen from the old picture, from the old picture to the new picture. Within a span of time, we slowly changed certain features in the image. And you see that there are profound changes in the whole scene. You have added an entire different facade over here. The board has changed over here. People have been introduced over here. This board has come up. This door has been changed to a window and so on. In a matter of a few seconds, we are able to do that. Yet, most of us can't notice all these seven changes. We might have noticed and paid attention to only a few of them because we are either very biased or we only have a limited capacity. And that is the profound topic of attention. OK, so I briefly mentioned both those ideas here. The two major ideas or behavioral phenomena that are involved in our attention is the fact that those two examples that I showed you must have convinced you that we have a very, very limited processing capacity. We are not able to see all the changes. And we are also very selective in what we pay attention to. You might have only paid attention to the bakery scene and the board on the bakery and the woman walking there. You might have missed the other side, the door, the window, and so on. It is all very natural. Different people will look at the world in different ways. But these are two major behavioral phenomena that are common to both, to all of us, in terms of the fact that we only have a very limited processing capacity and we are selective in what we want to learn further or, or know further. OK, so this is the this is a very, very important idea. Attention involves two behaviors. We have limited processing capacity and we are selective on what we are limit uh, with the limited processing capacity going to process for certain goals that we have. It might be, as I said, riding your bike, walking on the streets, or trying to find out a friend in a crowd. It could be any of that. So this is illustrated in psychophysics experiments where we reduce all the complexity of a very detailed scene into something very, very you know, uh, simple to test. And this is what psychophysics and neurophysiology efforts. OK, so for example, the limited capacity idea could be understood very easily, right? 
for example, if I pay attention to only A and B and my, my eye was fixed at this blue dot, and I ask you to report the red letters, with limited capacity, you will struggle to, talk, uh, to list N, P, and D. On the other hand, in the second case, it is just the N, so you will report it faster, earlier, et cetera, et cetera. And when it comes to selectivity, I could say something like you will only pay attention to one of the red letters or something, or the green letter. So it's very easy to draw your attention to the green letter or to one of the red letters. So with that, you are able to enhance what you're seeing. You might be able to see the N better than the P or the D or C in this example. So these two phenomena go hand in hand, limited processing capacity and selectivity. Another idea that is very, very common that we observe very, very clearly is what's called as either bottom up pop out slash salience behavior or top down attentional behavior. For example, you are still fixating over here and then I present an array of objects. In this case, I'm presenting letters from the alphabet. It is very clear every time I present something like this over here. One second, I think I removed my laser pointer. I'll get back to that. Every time I present something like this, the N, which is the only red one in the midst of all these green, pop up, pops up. So it is very, very easy for your attention to be drawn to this. On the other hand, unless I tell you, pay attention to N in this thing, you will not be able, to, you will not be paying attention to anything N like. You could actually paying be paying attention to C or P. But when I explicitly say your goal is to search for N, you will start searching one by one, and then you will finally get to N. Depends on how fast you are. But this is a pop-out effect, and this is a very top-down goal-directed effect. The next. So these are all like very broad ideas that I'm presenting. But I want to kind of go a little more in depth. Attention is not one thing. It is very many things. Uh, you have very different types of attention. And uh, people have done a lot of studies uh, in, the, in the field of psychology, which is called psychophysics, where they have made very, very precise measurements, which have actually helped people like us in neuroscience to understand the domain in which they're operating, their operating characteristics, their temporal characteristics, how fast we are able to attend, how long it takes for us to attend, how often we engage on something, how, how long it takes for us to disengage from something, all that comes from psychophysics experiments that psychologists in the past have done. Having said that, I'm going to give you a very, very broad uh, overview of the different types of attention. This by no means is complete, but these are just the very broad overviews. The first and most important type of attention that was studied is spatial attention, OK? When I am actually looking at something, and then I have to suddenly pay attention to something else. Let's say that I'm walking on the streets, and then suddenly something is coming near me. I have to disengage my attention from this object, shift my attention, start paying attention to that other object. So it takes a lot of time. There are different paradigms by which we can test that. One of the most famous paradigms was something that was proposed by Michael Posner in uh, 1980, which is something that we continue to use even today. You fix it. This is very important. We'll get back to this idea. In all these uh, attention-related experiments, you always fixate and don't move your eye. OK, they are all fixated at a central location over here, the plus sign over here. Then you're queued on a target. And if a target appears in that location, then it's called a valid trial. On the other hand, you're queued in the opposite direction, but the target appears in the other side, then it's an invalid trial. A third one is a neutral trial where it says, I can queue you either ways. It doesn't matter. You will still be able to look at the target. OK? What people have found, and Posner's experiment, and people have repeated in several different ways, and they've also done neurophysiology on top of that, is that 
when you pay attention to the target that you're cued to, and it's a valid trial, your ability to move your eye or say that there was a change or a target that appeared in this location is much faster. That's what you see over here. For valid trial, your reaction time is much faster than when it is an invalid time. So it takes time for you to move or switch when your attention is not directed as your cue suggested. Okay. Now, this is one type of attention where I'm asking you to look at particular spatial area, some location in space, this side of the road, that side of the road, or that side of the window, or this side of the, the, the room. So that's a spatial attention idea. But attention is not necessarily directed only spatially. Attention can also be directed to certain objects and features as well. OK, so this is a very important idea, too. And for example, humans, especially uh, higher order primates like humans and monkeys, we are very, very selective to faces. And we are also very, very selective to places. There are two different brain areas which are exclusively processing for faces, which is called the fusiform face area, FSA. And for places or objects and things in those places called parahippocampal place area. OK, so I can present overlaid an image of a face and an image of a, a house or an object. And I can ask you to selectively pay attention only to your the face or to the object. What happens is you can't contrast enhance the face and you actually throw away the distractor of the house or vice versa. What people have observed is depending on what you're observing, whether you are paying attention to the face or the, the house in the background, different brain areas are activated differently. The fusiform face area, which is selective to faces, is way more attentive when the, the face is to be attended. Okay. On the other hand, the place area is way more attentive, is way more active when you're attending to the house. Okay. This is as broadly as possible. I'm just suggesting this is just a, 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 a sketch of a slide from an fMRI experiment that they did in humans. So you have spatial attention. You now have object slash feature attention. I'm using features very broadly, but you can think of it as objects. And then there is another type of attention that is very, very common. We do this all the time. This is called as conjunction visual search. Okay. This is when you have to attend to both a particular feature or an object and also are looking for that object in a particular location. For example, in this image, I'm asking you to look at where's Waldo. Okay, Waldo is this famous French explorer who goes on and he always wears this red striped shirt. So in this image where it's a mostly grayscale, Waldo is very, very easy to find. So this is a very easy uh, search in this example. On the other hand, in this example, if I ask you to find the panda in the middle of all these snowmen, it's going to take you some time unless you are some, there are some people who can do it, do it really, really well. But for the most part, a lot of people struggle. It takes several seconds for people to actually find where the panda is in the midst of all these snowmen. I'll just leave it here because the panda is here. It's not easy to find. It, you, have, you go serially and you don't, you, it takes time. Okay. So what, what is the experimental outcome of this, the psychophysics outcome of this? It again goes back to that idea that I talked about. Uh, pop out, reflexive, automatic, and easy search, which is what that whereas Waldo was in the middle of a sea of people. The red dot is much easily observed in the midst of green dots and green X's, OK? On the other hand, the panda search is a conjunctive and a top-down, but a very, very diff difficult search. You have to look for the same red dot in this image, because there is also green X's, green O's, red X's, and so on. It takes us some time for you to find it, and you will finally find it over here in this location, OK? So with conjunction search, as the number of objects or clutter in the world increases, your reaction time increases, which means you need to start paying more attention and more and more and more. 
you have to start doing your spotlight of attention. You have to be roving. You have to be searching. And then you're always thinking about the red circle in the in your head. And then when you finally lock onto it, you say, oh, there it is. So with conjunction search, as the number of objects increases, the reaction time increases. On the other hand, with this pop-out search, if it's a sea of green and there is only one red, you immediately are able to latch onto that. So as the search size increases, it doesn't really matter. You will always be able to find that object. Okay. The third one, uh, I have put it in because this is something of active interest to people like myself and Bruno. But I thought for completeness, I should present it as well, which is that there is also a profound link between spatial attention and eye movements. Much as I said before, everyone, when they actually design experimental studies to do attention, they will say you should focus on a fixation spot. Then we will show things around that fixation spot. And then when changes occur, you either report it by pressing a button or moving your eye and so on. But for the entirety of the task until the end of the task, you're not allowed to move your eyes beyond the fixation. Okay. But there are profound, important aspects to actually moving your eyes because that is how you go about in the world. Okay. Your spatial attention and your eye movements are intricately related. And we are still trying to find out how intricately they are related. This is an open question. We are still working on it. I'll be happy to talk about it later, but it's not the, the, uh, the main topic of interest today. Just to tell you how profound this link between spatial attention and eye movement is, take this very simple example, OK? I want you to concentrate. I want you to pay your attention to only this red dot. OK, just keep looking at the red dot and see what happens to that purple halo that you see around it. When you're only fixating on the red dot and there is a purple halo, you will actually start seeing that if you don't make your eyes move, this whole purple halo completely disappears. It's as if there was nothing in the visual field. So your eye movements are very, very important for stabilization of the input image. If I, your eyes don't move, the world ceases to exist. So eye movement and attention are intricately related. And without your eyes moving, the world will disappear because of habituation and so on. OK? So this is the first example. But there are even more profound uh, uh, implications for your eye movement. So this is a very famous example. If, now that I've told you that attention and your gaze or your eye movements are related, but what comes first? We are still trying to understand this problem. It does attention come first and then your eye moves later or eye moves first and then attention comes later or both of them act together. This is a topic of very, very big, huge interest to people like me and Bruno. In fact, our actual research work involves this kind of an idea. Okay. This is a very famous study from Yarbus, Alfred Yarbus, uh, who was a very famous Soviet Russian scientist who did all this work in 1960s. Uh, he tracked the eye movement of people and asked them, I'll just show you a picture of a person. Please tell me, please just take a look at it. Okay. And then he tracked people's eye movement. These are called as scan paths. You see these lines over here. The people are looking at, if you look at it, it's very profound if you think about it, because you're looking at the eyes, you're looking at the nose, you're looking at the mouth, and then you're looking at the contour of the face, because this is how you and I look at people. We look at the contours of the face to understand how they, what features make their face. And that's how we identify if it's a known person or an unknown person and so on. And there are two different ideas here. There are large saccadic eye movements. Saccad means eye movements. There are large eye movements that you can make. That's like uh, going from here to here, here to here, here to here. But then you also see in this small area, I'm actually paying much, much attention to how this person's eyes are. Most of us, when we are in a social setting, we always tend to look at their eyes. And you see that we are making a lot more very, very, very tiny eye movements. These are called as microsaccades. 
And here is another example, again from Yarbus, who just told um, people to look at where the other people are looking. And then so every time when I was when the people were directed to say, like, look at this person, tell me where these people in this in this painting are looking at. You see that we are always going for their eye and then saying like they're looking at it over here. And then we see where their gaze is, where their gaze is, where their gaze is. So we can also be directed from above. We can be given top down signals or goal oriented signals to say this is how uh, people look at stuff. And Yarbas did so many different types of experiments. He asked them, uh, where are all the uh, objects in the house? If that is the case, in this picture, the eye movement starts differing. Where are all the people? Then you look at something like this. So with each different type of goal that I have told you, your eye movements differ and your attention to detail will also differ. Okay. The more you're concentrating your eye movements in certain locations, the more attention you're effectively paying. Okay. Now, this is a very broad overview of all the different types of attention. But I want to kind of tie them all together. We have actually talked about certain things that we can now put into some form of a very broad theme. And that's what I wish to show you now. I want to kind of give you a very broad sketch. These are no by no means perfect. These are no means uh, fully correct. But they are a way to think about understanding the phenomenon of attention. Okay. The first and the most popular is this idea from Broadbent, who was a famous psychologist in the 50s. He came up with this idea of what's called as top-down selective attention. What that means is there is sensory input. We'll stick with vision. There is input coming in. Some kind of a processing is happening where I'm able to look at contrast, color, etc., etc. But then remember, there are two aspects to it. Limited capacity and selectivity. So something gets channeled into the limited capacity. Some kind of a higher level analysis is done by your higher order brain regions, your executive functions. It could be your prefrontal cortex. It could be any of them. They give back top down dissenting signals that helps you to narrow down what you want to look for and selectively look at those objects alone and process them better. In the case of you navigating in traffic, you don't want to be paying attention to what's happening on the side streets. You don't want to be paying attention to who's talking to whom at the back of the car. You want to be only for focusing your attention on what's front of you and what is in the peripheral vision, whether there is a car that is zooming past you and so on. So that's what this descending influence helps you with. Okay. And then there is another version too. There are things called as early versus late stage of selection of information processing which says certain objects are processed at an early time. You're perceptually processing them. It could be groups of objects. It could just be color. It could be certain features. It could be certain orientations. It could be uh, certain shapes are getting processed at the very early level without you even knowing them or being consciously aware of. And then there might be a late selection. For example, I look at a chair. I need to have the semantic or symbolic notion of a chair to do any kind of a late selection. And that will change how I decide to pay attention to in the world. OK, so these are very, very broad ideas that people have had and wrestled with. And of course, we have now in enhanced it quite uh, a lot with a lot of studies in both psychophysics and neurophysiology. The third model that I'm going to present to you is something that I'm going to go in a little bit of detail, and that will be the rest of the lecture, is something that my boss and uh, Bruno's former boss, Bob DeSimone, came up with because he is one of the pioneers in the field of study of attention and measuring attention in neural activity in monkeys and humans. He came up with the idea of what's called as the bias competition model. What is the bias competition model? It already has the ingredients that we have already talked about, which is that, like I said, like I've even shown you with the examples, we cannot fully process every object in a crowded scene. It's a lot of objects to take in. Object recognition is always happening in a clutter. Okay. And in a crowded scene, those objects must compete for our pressure processing and awareness. As a result of which, there is a bias in our processing only towards the objects of behavioral relevance for us. If it is driving a car, it is the cars in front of us. It is the cars that are zooming behind us. 
And these objects which have high bias or high salience are more likely to win in some competitive dynamics against distracting objects. I don't care about the side pavement. I don't care about the people walking on the sides of the streets. Once you filter this distracting information out, your ability to recognize that object or whatever you need to do with that object in that clutter should be much, much more improved. Okay. Again, these are just statements that we have already observed. We are just putting them all together. Okay. This is the idea of a bias competition model. Now, finally, after all this talk, I'm going to tell you about the neuroscience and neurophysiology of selective spatial attention. Okay. For students, again, this is a very, very incomplete diagram. It is only looking at the cortical brain areas that are involved in attention and visual processing. Attention is a brain. One of the things that I want to uh, enforce today is that attention is a brain wide phenomenon. It is not localized to only one particular area. Several brain areas are involved. You get your inputs in your occipital lobe via your retina and your uh, lateral geniculate nucleus. That's your areas V1, V2, V3. They, and then in one direction, it splits into what's called as the ventral stream, which is telling you what kind of object I'm processing, what color of the object I'm processing, whether it's a face, whether it's a place, whether it's a house, etc., etc. And then there is the spatial component of it, which is your dorsal stream or the parietal areas, very broadly speaking, which are involved. And then there is top-down control from an area like your prefrontal cortex, especially FEF and area 45 and so on. So this is a very incomplete picture because we are still evolving this idea. And as I said, it's a, it's a brain-wide phenomenon. And one of the things that we have not even talked about is that there is also thalamic nuclear influence. There is uh, your different parts of your thalamus which are involved. There is your pulvinar which is involved. There is your superior colliculus which is making your eye movements which is involved. So it's a very, very uh, complicated network architecture, but it's a very global architecture that we are always engaged in when we have to engage ourselves in attentive visual behavior. Okay. Because it's very complicated, we can't talk about everything. So we are going to now reduce. How do we do that? We are only going to talk about what's happening as far as attention goes in the ventral stream or the what stream, which is involved in object recognition. So your eyes are somewhere over here, your LGN, which is your lateral geniculate nucleus of your thalamus is somewhere over here. It sends input to V1, a visual cortical area one, which is in the occipital lobe. And then there is V2, area V2, and then area V4, which is all in the occipital area. And then it finally goes to IT cortex, which is where you are able to recognize your objects. For the rest of the talk, I'll only be focusing on area V4. It is central in our lab and in very many labs with study attention because it is one of the first places that people actually found a neurophysiological correlate of attention. I'm not saying it is the only area, but it is a very prime area for us to study because it, the signal is very, very clear for us to observe. And our uh, PI, Bob Desimone was one of the very first people to start doing that. And it has now been established as an area which is involved in a lot of spatial attention and feature attention. OK. Now, what is the experiment? It's that same, same uh, Postner spatial paradigm. I fix it. I give you a cue. If the object is in that cue, uh, if, the, uh, if the target is in the queued location, which is in this direction over here, then it's a valid trial. On the other hand, I fix it. I give a, a queue that is going to be in this location, but then the target appears here. It's an invalid queue. So this is with exo endogenous queues. I can also give you exogenous queues, which is just the object appears. And then I say that I saw the object in that location, or I didn't see the object in that location. OK, so it could be both ways. Uh, this is a, a, just a technical way for us to ensure that we are not hard coding anything. So here is a schematic of what it looks like in V4 neurons when such a paradigm is followed. Okay. So this is 
an example where there are two locations. The one in red, uh, yellow is in one location. The one in red is in the opposite side of the hemisphere. So one object on this side of the hemisphere, the other object is on this side of the hemisphere. Okay. The plus is your fixation point. This is where you have to keep, not move your eye at all. Okay. Now, if the object that you're looking at, say it's a red bar, which is oriented horizontally, is in this location. And it also happens to be in the receptive field of the V4 neuron. The receptive field of a V4 neuron is the, the small patch of the visual world that the neuron in V4 sees. Okay. If I ask you to pay attention to this object and you your receptive field has this object, what happens is that the activity is lower because I am not paying attention to that object. It's just firing. Okay. Because my attention has been directed elsewhere. I still see this object in my receptive field, but it is not effective. So I actually have this kind of a firing rate profile after the stimulus is switched on at this time. Okay. On the other hand, if both the objects were presented in this manner, this is the receptive field. And I also ask you to pay attention to the object in the receptive field. What you see is enhancement of activity. And that's what you observe in this blue, in this red curve over here. You see with, with, with attention directed away, this is the signature of neural activity. And with attention directed towards that object, which is in the receptive field, you see this to be the activity. So you see this enhancement of neural activity. This is the neural correlate or signature of covert sustained attention in area V4. This is some work that my boss, or Bruno's boss, did in the 1980s, uh, where he adapted the Posner paradigm to neurophysiology. So now this is without any bias or competition, right? Because there is just this one object. I just didn't pay attention in this case, or I paid attention in this case. Now we can start thinking about what happens. Is the neuron always preferring only a red bar, then it is the most preferred object for the neuron. But the neuron might also be presented with an yellow bar, which the neuron might not like. I'm using the word like very loosely. Okay. So if the good stimulus is over here, the stimulus that the neuron prefers, which is a red horizontal bar, you see this big activity over here, huge activity in the neural activity. This is spikes per second or firing rate. Okay. On the other hand, when I present a poor stimulus, a stimulus that this neuron doesn't prefer, remember neurons in the brain actually, depending on the visual area and or any area, have certain features that they prefer. They might prefer color, they might prefer an orientation and so on. Again, this is a schematic. I'm just showing a schematic of a yellow bar, which is oriented in a slanted manner. You see that this is a poor stimulus. And so the activity is low, okay? It doesn't really prefer the stimulus, it's there. Now, when I put these two things together, they are paired and they're both in the same receptive field. You see something interesting happening. There is a competition that happens and because of the pair, it averages the two, okay? And you suddenly see that this is the activity of the neuron. So context plays a very important role. Context is what draws attention. Attention is a form of framing of what you want to look in the world. It might be goal directed or it might be bottom up or it might be dependent on the preference of the neurons. Okay. Now, let's say I'm going to add attention to it. So far, I just presented the objects. I didn't do any attention activity. Okay. Now, again, the good stimulus activity is over here. The poor stimulus activity is over here. And then the paired activity is over here. Now, on top of that, I tell you while you're fixating that pay attention to the yellow bar. What you observe is some kind of an enhancement, but it's still poor because it is not the object that this neuron prefers. Okay. On the other hand, if this is the preferred object and I ask you to pay attention to the red horizontal bar, you see something very interesting. There is still bias in competition, but the activity is trying to match as close as possible with the good stimulus itself. This is the idea of the biased competition model. And 
one of the important things is we find this in most brain areas wherever attention signals are observed that in the midst of clutter and there is a preference for a certain object in this case it is a feature which is a red horizontal bar all the other objects within the receptive field are competing with these objects and then you finally get an enhanced attentional signal that sustains over a certain period of time okay we can also have visual processing without attention and that usually leads to an averaging effect and this can be implemented now all of you are very aware of neural networks you they, you can implement them by normalization use some kind of a softmax or you can use competitive networks uh, recurrent fields etc etc convolutional networks whatever floats your boat okay one thing that we have observed, this is again uh, an extra addendum, I, you don't have to worry about it, is that people have also found out that with attention or some kind of a bias, the original receptive field might be so this big an area, it suddenly starts shrinking. What it means is I have now shrunk the, the total visual field that this neuron is seeing, but I am able to enhance the activity. So limited capacity, increased selectivity. And this, again, is work that was shown first by Bob Desimone working with John Reynolds, who was a former member of the lab with Bob. John Reynolds is a very big uh, neuroscientist now at the Salk Institute in San Diego. And Reynolds and Higa came up with the normalization model. It's one of the most cited models in uh, visual neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience. Okay. So what have I established so far? I've told you that there is a lot of clutter. There is preference for certain objects and depending on whether the, those objects are in competition and they are also in the receptive field of the neuron, they are they compete for the resources, i.e. the firing rate of the neurons. And depending on what you pay attention to, your neural activity can be enhanced or reduced. If it is an activity that is enhanced, then it means downstream areas like IT will be able to do object recognition better okay now i'm going to end with this part uh just two more slides this filtering of distractors is not only happening in v4 like i pointed over here this is v4 this is the receptive field sizes the the circles that i pointed are what a single v1 neuron or a v2 neuron is seeing okay they, are, they are, as you go to in the hierarchy from occipital area from V1 to T, V4 to T, O to T, E or IT, the receptive fields becomes larger and larger and larger. So there is more clutter and more distractors. So more competition has to take place. And finally, you might be able to recognize an object or a gist of a scene and so on. Okay. So V4 has this receptive field. So you have competing between this person's face and this girl's face, and you might have to look at something else. And who, whichever is behaviorally relevant, your attention will go to that person or that object over there. Okay. And this effect of attention, I, as I said, is reducing the influence of clutter. So this object is over here. So it's in this massive receptive field. But because of all the competition, if I ask you to pay attention to the book that the girl in the gray shirt is reading, this is how you will get to that. Okay. So this is intricately related to both object recognition and what you see in the world. And that is how you structure the entire world. Okay. Finally, I will leave you with kind of like that original diagram that I started with, which is that you have top-down attentional control that could be coming in from your parietal areas or your frontal life fields, which will tell you to direct your attention to somewhere. And that will change the activity in your what stream or the ventral stream. And it is this kind of combination of top-down, bottom-up input, what pathway and where pathway interaction that is giving rise to your ability to attend to only certain objects ignore large numbers of objects and as a result of which do whatever is important for you at that moment might be driving a car might be trying to find your friend in a crowd in a carnival it could be any of those things again i'm not showing anything from the thalamus and the superior colliculus this is only the cortical representations that i'm showing
so in summary, what I want to say is attention is a very, very profound cognitive phenomena. We better uh, try to understand it because it is important clinically because people with such deficits have a very, very hard time navigating the world. You might have heard I syndromes like attention deficit syndromes. You, should, you might have heard the terms like hemifield neglect. People are completely unable to pay attention to one side of their entire visual world and they suffer a lot. So that is on the clinical side. The second thing is it is one of the most profound basic scientific ideas that we need to solve if we want to understand how the brain works. Because without attention, there is no way for us to know which objects we will pay attention to, which objects are important, what is even reality for us. And the third thing is understanding the mechanisms of attention is very, very important for many of you who are now biologists, but might be interested in technology and neural networks and so on. If you don't include a mechanism like attention, you will not be able to fully understand intelligence in a manner in which the biological world works. Finally, I would like to leave you people with a social message. A lot of us make a big deal about multitasking. I hope I have convinced you that we are very, very good at unitasking. Pay attention to what you're doing currently and do that really well. Don't get distracted. Now that you all have a lot of laptops and phones and screens and all that stuff, Every time you engage in a task, whether it's studying or talking to someone, please be fully attentive to that alone. And that's how you actually are able to do a better job of that. Uh, with that, I'll end this talk. Thanks a lot. And uh, any questions, Bruno? Thank you very much, Krapta. Can you hear me? Yep. OK, thank you so much. Uh, I will just talk in Portuguese with the audience, OK? All right, all right. OK. So, uh, hey, by the way, Karthik, it was amazing. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Um, Thank you. Uh, uh, there were some things, by the way, that, that, that I needed to to hear to, to remind some some basic fundamental uh, concepts, by the way. Uh, I have a few, I have two questions, but let's see uh, the audience. Uh, pessoal, nós estamos uh, finalizando a palestra do professor Karthik, mas só vai acabar com suas perguntas. Então, por favor, façam suas perguntas e nós vamos ajudar traduzindo para o inglês, ok? Não, não sejam tímidos. O que vocês gostariam de saber da palestra do professor Kartek? Uh, while we wait for the audience, I would like to first thank you very much for your lecture. Impressive presentation, impressive data. Thank you very much. Kartek, I, I, I would like to ask you, is a kind of anecdote, but I would like your view about, about it. Uh, but one question would be, why don't we see everything, every time, in everywhere? Why right. we need a, 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 a selective attention point. to live in this world? Right. Okay. okay, here is a good example. Uh, I should have started with this. Uh, people can see me, right? Like uh, people use rules of thumb, uh, right? A rule of thumb is used. Uh, here is a rule of thumb in vision. Uh, it's a very important rule of thumb. Take your hand. My hand is very long, but assume that your hands are about one and a half feet. Okay, long. Okay, hold hold it in front of you and look at your thumbnail. Okay, thumbnail. Okay, L straight. Look at it at straight in front of you. That is one degree of visual angle, OK? Yeah. Now assume that you have 10 such thumbs going this way and 10 such thumbs going this way, OK? So they're all aligned. So they're all next to each other. So that will define one degree, two degree, three degree, four degree, and again, one degree, two. Your entire visual world, as far as an organism like you are concerned, OK, is fully what's called as the parafoveal vision. That is where you have the majority of processing ability, OK? If you were to pay equal attention to everything in the world, say something over there, something over there, something over there, everything equally, the size of the brain that is required just for V1, OK? Forget about other brain areas. 
should be 2000 times larger. Wow. Okay. So think of it this way. Our brain is doing something very, very important with very limited resources. If I were to operate like how, say, machine learning algorithms or computer vision algorithms, which give equal value to all pixels to begin with, if we are to operate like that, you know, what will be the size of our, we, uh, our brain? It will be the size of a truck. Okay. That's the simple answer. Evolution and biology has forced limited resources as a way to work and still navigate. It is remarkable if you think about it. What we see is so little. Every instance that what we are aware of is so little. Yet we are able to we we have this perception that we have a very rich worldview. But it's actually not a very rich worldview at all. It's a very narrow worldview. We are making it rich because of our experience, perceptual filling in. There are so many ideas that are going on there. But to answer your question, if we were to give equal importance to everything in the world, our brain's capacity, everyone would be like walking like a truck. Our brain would be the size of an elephant. Every person's brain would be the size of an elephant. Thank you. Yeah. We wouldn't be able to also to make choices, right? Yes. Choice you know, is a function you don't know what choice is right because you don't know which yeah. one is the right choice. You don't know everything is if it's equally if everything is equally valid, if everything is equally salient, what where will you take make your decision? Right? Yeah. Uh, for example, I one of the things that I didn't say, like driving is a good example. You're mostly very paraphobial, like looking at straight ahead. Uh, I'm assuming people drive slash bike. That's a simple assumption. And you pay attention to in your rear view mirror what's happening. Okay. So it's all in this very tiny thing. But the only time you actually start paying attention even to the rear view mirror is when something is moving there. Movement will shift your attention from paraphobial to peripheral vision. Okay. Uh, otherwise, you're always trying to have this almost, you know, the the idea of with the horse having that <laughs> uh, girdle, right? So that's how we are. And we are very, very good with that part. I see a question. Uh, in the case yeah. of anxious people, yeah. how the biases of selective attention can work? Oh, that's a uh, very hard question. I will try to, uh, I, I don't want to say anything too, uh, too out of the blue because uh, it's a, a very hard clinical question. Uh, there are people who suffer from a lot of anxiety. Uh, one thing is clear. If you are very anxious, if you are very stressed, um, your attention is taking a beating. It doesn't really work well. Uh, that's the best answer I can give. It, 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 a very stressed person is unable to pay attention. This is why I always get back to my very last slide, which is funny, but it is not just funny. Uh, even when you are stressed, it is very important for people to take a deep breath. I know you have other things that you might that might be going on as a concerted effort from your side, apart from other medications that you can take. It is important for people to, to remove all the distractors from their side. Let's say that you're an anxious person and you're studying for an exam. Most of them are students here. The best suggestion I can give is if there are too many crazy things around you, like say your phone is next to you, your laptop is next to you, there are people who are making noise, all that stuff, there is no easy solution. The only solution is to yeah. get yourself out of all those distractors. Keep your cell phone in another room. Maybe even put a headphones on or cotton on, focus on the book that you need to study. That is the only way you can overcome uh, the, the problem of anxiety as well, in a way, in the sense that you have to remove the distractors. You have to force yourself to say, I can only do this one thing. I'll try to do this one thing really well. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, is there any other question for the audience? No? So continue to think about... Uh, yeah, sorry. Tem uma, alguma pergunta, pessoal, da, da, do, do YouTube? Continuem pensando. Enquanto isso, então, vou fazer uma pergunta para o Kafka. Ok? Uh, okay. So, Kafka. Uh, they shouldn't be shy. Tell them that I am very friendly. <laughs> yes. Just, just, just give them some time. Right. More okay. questions will come out, probably. Um, just adding a little bit of what Divago said. So me and Divago, we were, our scientific career started 
studying uh, contrast sensitivity. Mm. So we, we learned very, very well with, with our um, uh, advisor at that time, Luis Carlos Silveira, that the brain likes contrast. So he oh. always said that the brain is specialized to detect contrast. The visual system is specialized to detect contrast. But the, the way I see attention is always um, relating to that, Shivago, contrast. So, but there is a contrast in value. So the brain needs to receive some credit uh, yeah. for what is seeing, visualizing, and so and this credit is not is not a more um, concentrated in line or color. is is a different credit. So it is still contrast. Attention well, is still contrast, but a different yes. type of so, contrast. So even here, you can say that this is uh, basically contrast yeah. enhancement. Yes. In the absence of direct, if the, if the signal doesn't have high contrast as such, attention mm -hmm. is a way to have your brain do the contrast enhancement for you. Right. So yeah. the, the world might be blurry, but if you start paying attention to the blurred image in the world, you might actually enhance contrast being one thing, but it's just that's that's contrast enhancement, very broadly speaking. So attention is a contrast enhancement. For sure. Yes, yeah. yes, that's amazing. And by the way, uh, the way I I got into this field and I and I and I, and I knew you was because of an article by Mansell, yep. where he showed that the contrast sensitivity curve in V one it was a little bit sharper than the, than the contrast sensitivity in V one without attention, right? Which is a bit controversial because to this day it was not yet decided if. V1 really respond to attention? It's very hard because yeah. it, it, uh, uh, there are recent studies that have come out now because we have much better technology. So we can do that a little more with optogenetics and even finer resolution eye movements and so on. Uh, people have definitely shown that. But it seems to be more the case that V1's activity, the attentional enhancement in V1's activity is mostly because of feedback from V4 yep. Yep. Uh, rather than you know, input level uh, attentional boost itself, like you see in B4, for example. Yeah. Bottom of salience will have uh, a boost. Yeah. Oh, there's one question for the audience. Uh, can you translate it? Yeah, of course. In the case of uh, depressed patients, there is some uh, changes in, vis in selective visual attention? Yes, very much. Very, very much, much so, yeah. uh, very much. So uh, the, if I can go back to the very first slide, uh, sorry. So I don't want to, I, I, I'm, I, I want to be very careful. I don't want to say that they are drowsy or uh, relaxed state people. Uh, I have not included people with certain disorders here. You could actually add that as well part as a global state. Depressed people in this very, very narrow and coarse uh, worldview uh, have a lot of uh, inattentiveness built into them. So their, their ability to do visual selective processing is diminished. Again, there are people who have done a lot of work on depression, who have shown that selective visual attention is significantly reduced. So it is part of the whole picture, right? People only don't talk about ADHD. It's not only hyperactivity. It is also the attention deficit part. People with depression are also implicated with attention deficits, uh, but it is a consequence of their depression. So if we can cure their depression, which is still a big, <laughs> hard problem to understand, uh, this will be resolved as well. But overall, uh, in, the, in terms of diagnostics, what you do observe is that people who are depressed uh, have a lower attentive state. It's because, but it doesn't mean that they are uh, attentive to certain things. It's like overall their arousal is lower and their vigilance is lower because they feel helpless. Uh, they feel they don't have the uh, ability or the talent or whatever. It, it's a combination of all those things. They feel down as a result of which they are not motivated. So motivation, arousal, vigilance are all going to, if they are reduced, your attentive ability also gets reduced. So, yeah. Cool. Oh, one more question. That one's in English. Oh, nice. In the case of having to divide attention, how does the bias act towards one stimulus or another? Uh, again, this is uh, there are two ways to think about it. Uh, 
let's say that I have not biased you in any manner. Like I've uh, like what I mean by that is I have not told you what you should be paying attention to, but there are two equally important things. The competition part will play. These two objects are competing. The winner of the two will be the one that you're directing your attention to, mostly. On the other hand, let's say that you might have certain bias. Let's say that you're in the middle of a crowd, you're looking for your friends, but then you see two of your friends. Uh, uh, I, how do you pay, divide your attention? Uh, something like, who were you prefer more? <laughs> there is an in, intrinsic bias that comes in play. Uh, divided attention kind of works that way. Competition will provide the bias for you. In the absence of explicit bias that you might have, when I say bias, don't think of it in the realm of how people use it socially. I mean bias in the realm of uh, you know certain objects have more activity. For example, when humans see red color versus blue color, red activates them more than blue. For example, like that. So if I were to give you two objects, red and blue, there is a higher likelihood that despite the fact that it might be two objects which look the same in every feature except the color you're more likely to, the red will win over the blue, unless the context is explicitly changing. Yeah. Uh, when someone becomes blind, it runs at once, where is response? Yes, very much. Oh, uh, this is a great question. Um, but we have to be very careful here. Uh, this doesn't really happen, let's say, in we don't know to what extent it happens into adulthood. What do I mean by that? Let's say if you're a kid, uh, who's growing up, you might have, say, visual deficits or auditory deficits or some sensory deficit in some modality. Then during the critical period, if you have critical development period will vary depending on the organisms. For humans, it's somewhere from, you know, nine months to about at least three years, if not more. Um, you will see that um, if the kid was, say, unfortunately born blind and you give the kid more stimulus in the auditory domain and other domains the auditory uh, cortex or the auditory processing is also done by the visual system okay however in adults we can't make a very let's say that someone was normal but suddenly because of some accident or something they go blind it is still not very clear whether there is enough neuroplasticity to suggest that whatever was initially recruited for visual processing in your occipital areas and so on will now be taken over for enhanced activity for auditory processing that is not fully clearly established people have shown some evidence that people who become blind or deaf later in their age recruit some part of that visual or auditory cortex to the other domain but it is not very clear in adulthood. But for children in critical period and they are born with certain deficits, they might be able to compensate that by making use of that extra um, cortical space. Yeah. But there are more questions, right? Oh, good, good, good. Uh, you need Do we have time for more, Javago? I mean, it's... Yes, yes. We have more five minutes is okay. Okay, yeah. cool, cool. I'm if, good to answer. I'm, I'm good, I'm good. I'm, I'm very happy to answer. Oh, that one is a hard one too, Kat. I, uh, I think so. Yeah, is there a, a pathology of kind of a, a metabolic pathology like diabetes? Uh, can you can it provoke some alteration in a selective visual attention? Uh, yeah, that's a hard one. I, I, if I give you an answer, I would. I want to be very honest. Whatever I'm going to say is very hand wavy. When I say hand wavy, it is not a good answer. I'm just speculating here, um, because metabolic metabolism is so very direct. Uh, the link between neural activity and the metabolic requirements of neural activity to actual cognition are very hard to establish so far. Okay. We know that our brain requires a lot of energy. That means it requires a lot of nutrients and sugar and fat and all that stuff to process. And then that will be translated into neural activity and that will be translated into cognitive behavior. So there are two jumps here. Uh, I don't know how to relate them in a meaningful manner, but I can say, yes, it should have some effect because 
uh, your brain is the most energy intensive organ in your body relative to its volume and size so if say someone who has diabetes mellitus that's, that's what that was the question that was uh, that means that there is not in a, enough energy or enough energy being appropriately provided to the brain that means the neural neurons are going to be malnourished <laughs> i'm going to use it in quotes which is possible then that it will actually reduce your cognitive ability you kind of see that right like i mean i can only again give you very behavioral examples it's hard to establish the chain from metabolism to neural activity to cognition we are at the very early stages of even trying to do a decent job of talking about neural activity to actual behavior right that is the hard problem that we are dealing with you are asking to you're asking a problem with, which is even it, it's two level harder two two levels deep and harder okay so but I, we can just go with very basic behavior people who are say diabetic when they actually are low on sugar you see that right they are unable to perform any active activity meaningfully so that would definitely cloud their judgment and ability and it might real, indeed cloud their eyes too they might start having poor vision when they are actually in the middle of their diabetes and not in having insulin into their body so that's the best answer i can give i don't want to suggest i have an answer because it's a very hard link uh, for example people do fmri uh, with humans fmri measures something called as the blood oxygen level dependent response or bold response uh, bold is an indirect measure of metabolism but we still don't know how that ties to the neural activity we only have very vague ideas about what bold response to neural activity means so yeah i can only give you a hand with the answer really sorry <laughs> i have one more question yes please. uh it's my last question okay uh, it's uh do we have in uh, selective attention every time or there is some moment that we are looking to the horizon and nothing is getting our attention yes uh, that is what i meant by inattentiveness right you're like zoning out is a form of inattentiveness it's a global state too you can be not paying attention to anything it could be almost nothing and i ask you what were you looking at you'll respond by saying i have no idea what i was looking at uh, it's kind of funny like when you think about it that way there are other crazy stuff that is also happening i don't know like i'm i'm coming back to the driving example but i think it it makes a little sense uh, if you have gone on long drives uh, you realize that right you be you're like almost like in an automatic mode and then for, after two minutes you realize like what was i doing i was right driving properly but i was not paying attention to anything so there is that level two there is a lot of autonomous quality too but i am only talking about the things that comes into awareness uh, but our global states are quite varied we have this very attentive state which is required if you have definitely if you have some kind of a goal or navigation that you need to do then the attention will come in play it's unavoidable unless the world itself is very bad it's like if the, if the world is like a martian landscape nothing is there it's a straight line it's no no rocks nothing then you just zoom past but otherwise you can you are in you're coming in and out of attention you're coming in and out of awareness you might be very relaxed again this is a open question it's a big big uh, issue we don't even know what are the big global states we have Uh, that's why you know the brain and neuroscience is very interesting and uh, whether you are in a, a clinician or someone interested in technology uh, you can go in any branch you want so it's a, it's a uh, and i hope i'm i'm convincing a few students to actually pursue uh, neuroscience <laughs> with this uh, yes. picture uh, cool yeah so i have a qu a question just this also my last my last one yeah. so karthik um again a hard one i think um what do you think is the future of visual attention after all in which direction we go into because we have our 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 approach or hypothesis uh, me and you and eric about this the sensory motor cortex Thank being you. the look, kind of the law um but what else what do you think well so that is definitely one big part of it like the fact that 
we have so far in most experiments separated the eye movement slash oculomotor system or the action part from the cognition part. The fact that they are intricately related is super important to establish first. And I think there are very many questions to answer even within that. Uh, so that itself is, a, in my opinion, a very long project to begin with. The second part I would kind of say is that we have so far only addressed attention as a mechanism, but yeah. attention to what end? So the fact exactly. that we have to, the fact that we have to move towards understanding cognitive flexibility or goal-oriented behavior, I, I think of attention and understanding mm -hmm. attention as one of the first steps to understand how we can talk about goal-oriented behavior, which is what the organism does. Uh, we, don't, we, we have very vague uh, worldview about what goal-oriented behavior is and how it emerges in the mechanisms of the brain. Almost every person who has talked about it has only a wishy-washy idea of what goal-oriented behavior is. We have not shown any mechanisms. We have not shown how it is brain-wide and how they are all put together. If we can answer attention as one narrow phenomena, which is a framing of all of reality, like I say, like, you know, this worldview of mine, I don't think attention is some separate thing. It is a very thing that is able to shape how we see the world. Yeah. If that is the case, then it is the, the pathway towards goal oriented behavior and flexibility. Like the, the alternative question is like this, right? Um, people in certain sections of both vision and machine vision think that all of vision is ab about object recognition. Oh, it's not. Of course, you don't. You and I don't have that view. I'm just yeah. saying, most people think if we have solved object recognition, we have solved vision. Yeah. But that is not vision. Vision is in service of the organism's ability to survive in this world, move in this world, uh, and explore this world. So that goal-directedness, goal-oriented nature, how does it emerge, is something that will come immediately after this. And in, within our idea of oculomotor attentive system, we already have the seeds of it, right? Because it is explore, exploit, combined together, which is the old way that, say, the evolutionary uh, uh, synthesis people will think about in the, in the, in the, in the, in the fact that it is uh, fight or flight, explore, exploit, you know, appetitive versus aversive behavior. It is kind of that push-pull is what this oculomotor um, attention network is trying to do but it's at a slightly more abstract level than your you know fight or yeah. flight or push pull behaviors but this opponent processing and the synthesis of that opponent processing is going to give rise to newer phenomena that we don't even understand yet yeah that's Excellent. my personal belief yeah thank you very much thank you Karthik. thank you so much so again bruno and Karthik, thank you for coming and sharing with us this discussion about visual selection here in Brazil, in Berlin. We Thank have you. a school of visual scientists that this kind of uh, issue is... Uh, we, we have more in, many interests in, in this kind of stuff. Thank you very much, Karthik. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. I mean, it cool. was a pleasure. I would uh, Next time, if I'm going to talk to people, I would also like to see the students. <laughs> uh, yes, that's a good idea, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I, I enjoy talking to students. I mean, I uh, I take it very seriously talking to students. And if you have students who have questions, uh, please send them my way. I'll be very happy to answer as well. Yes, and one day you will be here in Brazil. I will definitely make that trip. Yeah. I have promised you that. I will definitely that come. That would be back. great. Yes. Drink some takaka. <laughs> <laughs> so I will say goodbye for the people in Portuguese. Então, pessoal, obrigado pela presença os alunos do programa, os colegas de outras universidades, vi aqui o professor Javier Santijan, da Universidade Nacional de Tucumã, na Argentina. Então, pessoas de vários locais aqui. Um abraço a todos. Tchau, tchau. Tchau, tchau, Bruno. Bye, tchau. bye. Thank you, Karthik. See you, Bye, bye.